sold. So while my data sets have their limitations, I think that they still offer rich insights and starting points, which can always be explored more deeply in the future. Uh, so before the COVID-19 pandemic inherently influenced uh, the uptake of more digital D&D play, the findings from my first study indicated that the modern play of D&D was indeed hybrid, a mixture of both digital and non-digital playing practices. 85% of the players I interviewed and observed emphasized the impact of digital platforms, paratechs and tools on their own play and consumption of the game. When asked about how they accessed game materials or enhanced their D&D games, these players cited a variety of digital examples like Twitch streams, YouTube videos, actual play podcasts, platforms like D&D Beyond, Roll20, DMs Guild, and even just the internet more generally. I found this very interesting and sometimes a little bit conflicting as many of these same players had argued and positioned the appeal of D&D in opposition to that of digital games and their experiences. Participants were praising the immersive tactility and benefits of in-person social and physical play while simultaneously using phones or digital assets to enhance their games. In my second study last year, I wanted to extend this exploration of digital versus non-digital D&D play to understand and account for contemporary play contexts, preferences and motivations. I dedicated a whole section of my survey to exploring the impact of COVID-19. A large majority of the participants in the survey indicated that the location of their D&D play had been affected in some way. Supporting this, I found that just over 80% of participants either play D&D only digitally or both digitally and offline. With less than 20% of my sample size solely engaging with D&D as a traditional in-person tabletop role-playing game, the combined data from both of my studies reflects an instance of what Henry Jenkins calls convergence culture. So convergence culture is described as the flow of content across multiple media platforms. Jenkins reflected on the relationship between concepts such as participatory culture, collective intelligence, transmedia storytelling, and even collaborative authorship to explain how consumers and fans were now active agents in the media that they consumed and created. I think that these concepts absolutely capture what it means to be a contemporary D&D player and part of the wider D&D community today. In comparison to the sometimes passive nature of digital games, D&D players have the ability to be actively involved in the D&D campaigns they participate in, consume, and sometimes even create for the broader community. Through this lens of convergence culture, we gain a better sense of why the increased digitization of D&D, both inside the game and beyond the game, have been key contributors to the game's modern resurgence and appeal. So as mentioned previously, participants in both of my studies highlighted examples of digitization in their own D&D play. Most notably, responses drew attention to the impact of greater access to game materials, as well as the positive and negative implications of digital tools and assets on the overall experience of D&D. As new media and technology uh, continues to shape contemporary gaming cultures and environments, Responses across both of these studies suggested that the D&D community as a whole had made a considered effort to reduce the barriers of entry into the game, contributing to its wider resurgence. This was accomplished by offering more digitally and financially accessible alternatives to in-game rules and materials. One of the participants in my first study, a longtime D&D player and DM, stated that because of new media platforms like D&D Beyond and DMs Guild, in combination with the freely available systems reference document, there was more access to all kinds of cool D&D stuff that used to be a lot of hard work or money to get. It's easier to get into the game now than ever before. Another participant from my second study also explained that D&D was being swept up in this greater cultural trend of things becoming more accessible digitally. The visible and invisible role of fan labor and content creators was also highlighted and leans into previous work published by Aaron Trammell on analog games and the digital economy. 
In addition to greater access options, digital platforms and tools were also used to enhance in-game play experiences. In my first study, players involved in an in-person game were observed using digital dice rollers, tracking digital character sheets, and even using sound ambience apps such as Sirenscape to support their play. Other in-person groups were also seen using digital technology to provide visual representations of in-game characters and environments as opposed to physically created ones. The ability to recruit players and play D&D online through platforms like Roll20, Tabletop Simulator, and even Discord or Zoom was repeatedly mentioned by uh, in survey responses as a major reason behind the increased or continued play of D&D during periods of lockdown last year. For players that are unable to play D&D in person for various reasons, these digital alternatives allow them to keep engaging with the game that they love playing. With more modern research like Melissa Rogerson's interested in how digital tools like AI can be used to enhance experiences with the game, it's possible that the future of D&D may become more digitized than ever before. In contrast to these positive implications, there was also a solid counter argument presented against the increased digitization. In both studies, uh, participants noted that the physical sociality and limited screen time often associated with in-person D&D play was a key part of the game's modern appeal for them. Participants made it clear that what they loved about D&D was the immediacy of it in their body. Limited screens and minimal parameters on play allowed some players to feel more immersed and engaged during gameplay sessions. This sentiment was also echoed by others who said that there was something really simple and appealing about not being in front of a screen, just having a pen, paper, and your imagination run wild. Interestingly, when asked to reflect on the impact of COVID-19, a common argument put forth by some of the participants was that Although D&D was absolutely fine to play online or transition digitally, it just wasn't the same as playing the game in person. However, as we all know, different players have different expectations of the game space and motivations behind their play of D&D. So I think it'd be really interesting to explore this notion a little bit further in the future. Uh, it's also really important to consider that online or digital play is not always viable for all players for a variety of different reasons. In its traditional tabletop role-playing game form, D&D can often be perceived as an accessible digital game alternative. As one of my participants articulated, D&D is video games for people who can't play video games. Along with in-game digitization, representations of D&D play in digital media have also contributed to the game's broader resurgence in popularity and play. In particular, the actual play live stream Critical Role was repeatedly mentioned by participants across both studies. Critical Role and other successful D&D media like it reveal successful convergence culture in action and the impact that this has had on driving increased interest towards the game. The show presents old media, a home D&D game, through new interactive media like Twitch and YouTube. And the popularity of this stream and initial convergence has resulted in positive fan cultures and collective intelligence surrounding D&D content. Subsequently, this has led to dedicated transmedia storytelling, which inherently appeals to different demographics of potential players. In 2019, Critical Role raised 11.3 million US dollars from their fan base on Kickstarter to create an animated show reimagining adventures from their live stream. This show was co-opted by the mass media conglomerate Amazon, which will undoubtedly draw even more interest towards D&D. More recently, collaborative authorship has allowed Critical Role to release an in-canon campaign setting published by Wizards of the Coast themselves. Convergence culture has allowed consumers of D&D to now become producers of D&D on a level unmatched previously. The show's progression from a home campaign to live broadcast to mass media partnered animated series to in-canon campaign guide exemplifies the impact that convergence culture has had on D&D's modern resurgence. It also highlights the relationship and link between both digital and non-digital D&D practices. 
I think it echoes the sentiment of one participant stating that d d was really well suited to the way that media was moving. Uh, so just to briefly conclude and summarize my main points, uh, although there are many factors that have probably contributed to d and modern resurgence and popularity, I believe that the game's ability to be either fully or partially digitized and provide hybrid play experiences has allowed the game to reach a wider audience and continue flourishing in today's predominantly digital games landscape. Moving forward, when thinking about or discussing the contemporary play or plays of D&D, it'll be really important for both scholars and media commentators to be able to situate, contextualize, or even just understand the wider influence that convergence culture and digitization have had on the design, play, and legacy of the game. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Thanks, Pri. That was wonderful. All right, um, moving on. The next presentation is uh, by Bill White, um, and it's Grappling with Dragons at the Forge, the Discourse of Dungeons and Dragons in the Indie Tabletop Scene. Um, and uh, the very cool thing about Bill White is that he um, went to the same doctoral program that I did uh, about 10 years or 20 years before I did. So I've always uh, thought that was like super cool. And I'm like, what are the chances that I wrote my diss on Dungeons and Dragons? And uh, Bill, who also researches this very seriously, uh, came through this program also. So I guess there was something happening at good old Rutgers in New Jersey. Um, but anyways, um, Bill White is an associate professor of communication, art and sciences at Penn State Altoona. A rhetorician and game scholar, his research interests include the rhetoric of knowledge, the structure of knowledge producing communities, and the discourse of games. He teaches public speaking and media related courses in addition to introductory level courses in video game culture and game studies. He's the author of Tabletop RPG Design and Theory and Practice at The Forge, 2001 through 2012, as well as scholarly articles on rhetoric, communication, and games. Additionally, he's written a number of tabletop RPG game supplements, some at my very hobby shop, in, uh, in uh, Fullerton, California, and served as the creative director for the Fate Space Toolkit. Um, he and his brother produced Vital Play, a podcast of role-playing games, native New Jerseyan, Bill lives in Altona, Pennsylvania, and is a great uh, game master. So uh, take it away, Bill. All right, I hope you can uh, see my screen. Uh, I've changed the title of the talk to uh, Hard Looks and Heartbreakers, the discourse of D&D at the Forge. And um, I'll just, uh, Did I mute myself? Can you hear me? All right, moving forward. The, um, the, the, I guess the first place to start is with what was the Forge and uh, Pre talked about participatory culture. And uh, I think the Forge is an, an example of that. It was a discussion site, but as I've tried to show with these uh, photographs, it was also intensely interested in production, producing, uh, designing, um, uh, selling uh, tabletop role-playing games that uh, weren't Dungeons and Dragons. And, and that was a, um, uh, uh, I think that sort of uh, sets up the, the, the problem that uh, I want to talk about, which is if, uh, what does it mean uh, to exist in this space where Dungeons and Dragons is uh, central to um, uh, uh, the, the role-playing hobby and the role-playing industry, uh, and you're trying to do something different from that. And so thinking about thinking about the relationship between the Forge as a site of independent production and independent creation of role-playing games that are different from Dungeons and Dragons uh, is, is the place where I think this uh, investigation starts. The um, uh, uh, founder and uh, chief uh, voice uh, moderator uh, of the Forge, Ron Edwards, uh, in a conversation with him, he, he told me, well, you know, uh, um, uh, by 2008, People had said uh, the, the idea was that, oh, the Forge hated d d but that, that wasn't true. Uh, uh, looking back, he said, um, uh, we, um, we, d we didn't, uh, that became the impression, but it wasn't the case. And um, uh, he attributed it to uh, the emergence of different uh, ideologies of d d d d he's talking here about the uh, old school Renaissance and a different sense of what d d was and how it related to the hobby. And so um, looking back at that or looking uh, uh, 
uh, looking back from uh, 2008 or 2009, where he's talking, what is he, um, you know, the question is, well, what is he referring to? Is, is he, uh, uh, it's possible to suggest, oh, maybe he's being a little bit disingenuous because certainly there's some sense of, um, some, sense, some sense of opposition. The, um, uh, in fact, you know, he may be talking about this thread that uh, appeared in the Adept Press Forum, Ron's sort of personal forum, where uh, a person came out right and asked him, why do you hate Gary Gygax? What's, uh, <laughs> what did he do to you? And uh, uh, Edwards is shocked. He says, no, no, I've critiqued his ideas. Um, my focus is on uh, designing for play and owning, you know, a creator ownership of, of work. And so how um, that's my critique of, of Gygax, um, but it's not, it's not personal by, by any stretch of the uh, imagination. Um, and, and he also says, you know, I give Gygax credit for having the guts to publish a role-playing game. Uh, not, he, he, he um, says, you know, he didn't invent it, didn't create it, but he pulled together stuff and had the guts to publish it in a space where that hadn't been done before. Uh, and so at about the same time, um, uh, you know, Edward's engagement with the, uh, with the old school Renaissance um, amounted to, uh, I think some, uh, some people read uh, a piece that he published in um, an OSR zine called Fight On, where he uh, essentially hectored the old school Renaissance for being too tame, uh, unwilling to um, adopt the, the original um, model of swords and sorcery fantasy that he um, uh, uh, cut his teeth on and that he found to be the inspiration for um, uh, dungeons, uh, the original uh, role playing scene. Uh, and so that, that, that could contribute to the sense perhaps that emerged of, of opposition between um, the forge uh, and D and D. Uh, additionally, looking even further back, the idea of the fantasy heartbreaker, which is a term that uh, Edwards coined um, uh, back in 2003, where he looked at games that had been published in the 90s, independently published by um, uh, um, uh, designers, modeling their games on D&D &D, uh, and um, uh, having, having uh, a weakness that he attributed to un, unreflexive, un, uncritical um, uh, adoption of D&D um, &D, uh, motifs and tropes and mechanics without, uh, without understanding or thinking about why they were there. Um, but additionally, I mean, there was a very appreciative strain in uh, the, the looking at these fantasy heartbreakers. They broke your heart because there was something, uh, as you said, uh, they're products of actual play. They, people love them, uh, or they were a product of love, uh, and they showed creativity, uh, even if some of their innovations weren't as innovative as the uh, designers thought. Uh, but, and, and people at the Forge took up the notion of fantasy heartbreaker. Certainly, some of that take up was critical. Uh, uh, why, why don't, uh, why don't the creators of uh, these fantasy heartbreakers, these these uh, D and D um, uh, essentially uh, derivative works, uh, take more seriously the obligation to look at their assumptions? Um, but others recognized the fantasy heartbreaker as a model for how people engage with the hobby. Yes, I want to create something of my own, modeled on D and D, uh, and so they broke out and shared the things that they had created, even if they hadn't tried to publish them and um, mortgage their house to create them, uh, you know, to publish them, uh, but they had, they had written them, they'd worked on it, and they were glosses or variations on D&D. &D. Uh, so the notion everyone should write a heartbreaker was something that um, uh, was a, a, a prominent motif in how people talked about the D&D um, uh, &D and engaging with D&D. Uh, uh, in at least in the early days of the forge, but all that is really kind of a prologue. Um, clearly, we, um, uh, one of the things I, I like to point out, or, or, or that uh, I've realized, is that while there's a strong identification between uh, Ron Edwards and the forge, there's um, uh, the the forge and Ron Edwards were two different things. The, the forge was the scene in which Edwards operated, certainly. Um, but there are many other voices there. And so in order to make sense of uh, how people engaged with D&D at the Forge, thinking about you know, reading the threads is a really important uh, element. I like to think of the Forge as a um, communication artifact, the residue of 
interactions and, and this participatory culture. Uh, and so in looking at, um, looking at the forge, you're looking at threads, you're looking at posts made by individuals um, who are asking questions and sharing their experiences and they have things to say. And so, you know, here's an example of the kind of thing um, that people post, uh, people posted. And, and the, the thing that I'm pointing out uh, here, or the reason why I'm showing you this is to show how you can look at a post and see motifs emerge in terms of how the, um, how the writer, how the poster is um, positioning himself with respect to D&D. Um, they talk about running it. Uh, they talk about the problems that emerged in running it. And they mention texts that are associated with it. Uh, and so um, the thing that I did was just a, a quick, uh, quick search, um, just using Google, um, using a site search um, uh, option uh, for d and I, I didn't look at any other um, variations such as DND or anything like that, just the just the D&D motif. And that, that produced uh, on the order of 272 uh, or returned 272 threads, uh, which um, in, and, uh, in different forums, in different sub forums of the Forge as a larger discussion site. Uh, and I noticed that a plurality, I mean, maybe 40% were um, in one forum, the actual play forum, which um, unlike other forums, lasted the whole time. It was there at the beginning of the forge and lasted until it closed. Whereas other forums, the theory forums, some of the individual publisher forums closed down or were, or were uh, made inactive uh, at some point during the life of the forge. And so uh, it seemed like if I wanted to think about, okay, what's the, uh, What's the, um, uh, how, does the, how does the pattern of engagement with d, &D change over time? That might be a good sort of way to focus that, um, recognizing that by not searching on variations of d and I'm uh, obviously uh, not necessarily representing all of the ways that people talk about it. Um, uh, but I was interested in how, you know, how was that distributed over time uh, in, in the forge and the, uh, um, the understanding of Forge history, uh, the internal understanding of Forge's history by its participants was divided up into uh, using a sort of an annual metaphor of uh, spring, summer, fall, and winter uh, with the idea that spring was this period of uh, ger uh, germination and, and sowing, summer uh, blooming and, and um, uh, spreading out, fall, a period of retrenchment, and winter uh, closing and shutting down. And you can see in the uh, pattern of um, uh, actual play threads, those counts are, um, for, the, for the entire actual play forum over the life of the forge, the, dis the distribution of um, threads uh, uh, across uh, periods. And uh, when I looked at the, um, when I looked at the uh, threads that were arguably about D&D &D because they either had D&D &D as uh, the title of the post uh, or included D&D &D in the title of the post or mentioned D&D &D in the original post, uh, starting the thread um, uh, that uh, they were about D and D, and so uh, in looking at the proportions, right, comparing those, it seems um, I was pleased that, uh, especially in those middle phases, the proportion of D and D threads was about the same as the proportion of threads in the whole forum, uh, and so that gave me the sense that where it diverged was not because I was missing something necessarily, but because uh, the people were really talking about. D and D uh, less earlier and more proportionally later, and so the notion that um, this this data kind of shows perhaps that um, there's uh, more willingness uh, to talk about D and D uh, as the life of the forge grew on, or more interest in it uh, as time uh, passed is is maybe suggested by these numbers, which admittedly are very small. I mean, the ninety threads that we're talking about amount to about maybe point. 2% of all of the actual play threads. Um, and so this is where um, it gets, uh, uh, like thus far, uh, I think uh, everything is, is pretty straightforward uh, in terms of uh, looking at something, looking at a thread and saying, yes, it contains D&D &D or it doesn't. Now uh, uh, I have to make uh, an interpretive move in order to figure out, okay, how have things changed possibly uh, over the course of the life of the forge? And so in looking at those, Threads, I identified, you know, going through them, a number of motifs, uh, ways that people use D&D, &D, 
uh, and and uh, as I say in the bottom left uh, box there, uh, it's it's only you know single coder interrelated reliabilities cannot be calculated, uh, and so I, I acknowledge that that's a weakness. Uh, that it's clearly just my interpretation, but as a rhetorician, I'm willing to be interpretive, like to suggest that my reading is a reading and, and I offer that as a reading. Uh, but, um, you know, these different motifs, uh, D&D, vis -D, other games, that is often uh, some will list the games that they play or will make comparisons between one game and another. Uh, and so that was the way that I coded that. D&D problems, obviously game mechanical problems, things that um, the, the poster uh, is trying to solve. D&D tropes uh, may be positive uh, or appreciative or maybe negative and, and a little eye rolling, uh, but this is what we do when we play D&D. Old school is, of course, uh, uh, just the use of that term, use of the phrase, old school. D&D as identity is when someone um, is uh, identified as a D&D GM or a D&D player, right? The notion that D&D is part of their identity. Uh, and that's different from D&D as a text. We saw an example where a, a book is mentioned or a version of the game uh, is, is mentioned. Uh, and then finally, D&D as an activity, someone talking about playing, right? I, we were playing, this is what we played, oh, I want to play with you, anything like that, sort of D&D as an activity. And the, um, uh, again, you know, there's, there's um, I feel like the, the numbers are a little small to do any kind of uh, statistical analysis. Uh, I was hoping to calculate Z-scores, but um, I, uh, uh, I'll just say I ran out of time. Um, the, uh, but, but I think there's some, in looking at the pattern, some numbers are suggested. I've tried to highlight where that um, uh, where that uh, appears. And uh, so, if you look uh, down the column of the spring, you see, oh, gee, um, it looks like um, maybe D and D as text is less uh, a part of the um, a part of that conversation. It's um, uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, the 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 uh, across seasons it, it seems to be um, uh, you know the average or the mean about 0.24 the um, uh, the uh, uh, within the seasons about 0.16. Um, uh, Aaron just showed up on my screen, so I feel like that means I'm running low on time. So let me just skip to the end, uh, which uh, I believe will um, which follows directly on this um, uh, on this slide. So I'll just uh, skip over. A look back at the um, engagement with the history of D&D &D and uh, try to just sort of relate, here's the story that I think this tells, um, particularly with an eye towards that distribution of, of threats. Just look at the structure of motifs. And as you can see in the early uh, making sense of D&D &D as um, uh, mishmash procedures, but not a coherent design, uh, the idea that heartbreakers, we're trying to get D&D &D out of our system, there's an interesting um, uh, transition between the fall uh, and uh, correction, the, the summer and the fall, where um, that fall, that intense period of experimentation with games, trying to get D&D players to play our games in later phases, uh, we were playing D&D and trying to engage with it. And so that's the main takeaway is that um, uh, there's a change in D&D um, as other, D&D as part of what we're experiencing. Thanks very much for your time. I appreciate it. Um, look forward to any questions you may have. Thanks for the wonderful presentation, Bill. Um, and remember, uh, if you're in the audience, please do add questions for the Q&A um, while the presentation is going on. We love questions, and we're going to have plenty of time at the end of the panel uh, to discuss them. So the next, um, the next uh, paper is Playing the Believer, Prioritizing Dimensions of Religion in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. And this is uh, from Leonid Moises, I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, at, Russian, uh, at the Russian State University of the Humanities. And Leonid is a religious scholar from Moscow, a game researcher, and a longtime tabletop RPG and board game player. His main focus of research is representation of religion in games, both digital and analog, especially different kinds of RPGs and strategies. And his interest includes approaches to simulation of romantic and other types of emotional attachment through rules and more broadly relationships between modern pop cultural narratives and game design. He teaches a course on the history of tabletop games for the future game designers in the Institute of Business and Design at Moscow. His favorite RPG systems are the first edition of Sea and World of Darkness, especially Changeling the Dreaming 
and he's discovered different games based on Powered by the Apocalypse engine and has completely fallen in love with them. He likes uh, Legacy Life, Among the Ruins, and Monster Hearts, and has even designed his own mon uh, playing Powered by the Apocalypse act about aristocracy in early modern Europe. That sounds interesting. Uh, combining all of his different interests in scholarship and gaming. Uh, really excited to have you here, Leonid. Can't wait for your presentation. Give it to us, please. Thank you very much. If I knew you would be reading all of this out loud, I would keep it much shorter. Uh, I'm terribly sorry. Um, so anyway, uh, Zoom. Uh, can you see the presentation? Yep. Uh, should I make it full screen? I do not understand how Zoom interface works, so I'm not sure what exactly I've seen. <laughs> okay, it anyway. Is, it it uh, looks anyway. good right now. But let, let's do it like this. And that's even better. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for this great opportunity. I hope you would be able to understand me through my thick Russian accent. And let's begin. Um, my presentation addresses the way fifth edition of Dungeons and Dragons represent religion, and in particular, religious believers. I will limit myself to the analysis of the rules present in character handbook uh, without mentioning materials uh, from other sources because of time constraints, but uh, uh, most of things I will present now are, um, can be applied to previous editions of Dungeons and Dragons uh, and uh, to uh, different uh, additional books. Uh, but anyway, let's focus on character handbook. Uh, in my work, I use a uh, concept of resonance uh, uh, and it's understanding by Adam Chapman in his book, Digital Games as History, how do video games represent the past and of access to historical practice. Uh, you can see his definition. Uh, Chapman, uh, by resonance, he meant the sensation of interpreting a representation of the game as relating to something other than only the game's rules, as referring to something not entirely contained within the game itself and of the everyday world in which we live. Basically, resonance is a situation when we recognize part of the game as uh, related to something outside of the game. Uh, Upperlay. Uh, Thomas Upperley uh, also introduces the term configurative resonance, uh, which involves the player deliberately configuring and or performing actions in the game out of all possible potential configurations and performances in order to create a specific resonance. Uh, I believe both of those ideas are very familiar for any tabletop RPG player. We use the resources provided by the game to create characters, plots, specific game situations that refers to something outside of the game. Uh, a favorite movie, a book uh, which inspired our next character, a political issue, a political situation, a joke, and so on and so forth. Uh, the system here, both in terms of rules and the term of fiction, uh, acts as a set of what Jonas Linderoth called affordances, a term he borrowed from ecological psychology of James Gibson. Uh, Gibson, in turn, described the affordances as following. The affordances of their environment are what it offers the animal. Well, he was a psychologist, not a game designer. Uh, uh, the animal, what it provides or furnishes, either for good or for ill. And tabletop role-playing game system can be thought of as such an intellectual ecosystem, providing us with different affordances for actions, whether small, like describing a particular feat of our character, or more complex action, like creating and role-playing a character we always wanted to play at. So in this case, we can uh, conceptualize this as a single action, affordances for which uh, are provided by the game system. Uh, specifically, D&D does the latter through classes, backgrounds, archetypes, and races, which was described at length today, uh, and which are obviously referred to imagery from Western fantastical milieu. Thus offering player affordances to experience a configurative resonance inspired by the recognition. We basically we read Tolkien, we may be able to play as Tolkien-esque character. Uh, and to my theme, idea of resonance illuminates the fact that D&D constantly refers to uh, some ideas and images from the sphere of religion. Uh, 
Among the 12 main classes of fifth edition, four uh, paladins, clerics, monks, and druids clearly resonate with religious themes and tropes. Moreover, three more classes, ranger, warlock, and barbarian, offer affordances to frame them very easily in the religious context as well. Uh, and also the addition of mechanic of backgrounds in fifth editions, edition uh, allowed to make any character associated with religion through the background accolade. Uh, this abundance of religious elements in character creation is supported by a variety of other game elements that resonate with uh, either Christian tradition or some polytheistic tradition or uh, other elements from world uh, religions. Religious monsters, like demons, obviously, for example, religious artifacts, religious spells, uh, popularity of different sort of cultists as an antagonist for players, so on and so forth. While I do not want in any way to justify the infamous satanic panic of the 80s, the very idea that Dungeons and Dragons has something to do with the religious, with the religion, in fact, it does not sound as crazy as it might seem at first. Of course, if I understand religion as a set of cultural artifacts and texts, not a spiritual practice. And I just, you know, love this comic uh, book, so I had to include this uh, uh, in my presentation. Fun times. Um, uh, all of this begs the question, but how exactly does the D&D portray religion? The short answer is however we want, since tabletop RPGs are ultimately limited only by our imagination. However, I believe that using the cycle of resonance affordances to create configurative resonance, experiencing configurative resonance, and then seeking affordances to experience another set, another configurative resonance. Through analyzing the cycle, it is possible to capture types of characters, scenes, and plots that are easiest to create in a specific game system, thus highlighting its ideology of representation a particular sphere, in this case, religion. To analyze the presentation of religion, I use Ninian smart concept of religious dimension. I won't uh, bother you with context since uh, I'm a bit uh, running late on time. Uh, smart ideas were very anti and essentialistic. He wanted to provide this set of dimensions which are present in any religion without creating any sort of hierarchy. Uh, between them. It's just a tool to conceptualize an empirical information about religion. We come to a religious community, we interview it, or we come uh, upon some religious text, we read them, and we can use those elements to conceptualize their religion. I believe the terms are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, I provided uh, um, uh, examples, so uh, let's uh, just uh, skip to the um, my main idea. Uh, I divided uh, religious uh, dimensions in D and D uh, uh, in three categories in terms of how affordable they are. Core religious dimensions are those which cannot be ignored when you are playing an openly religious character like paladin or member of acolyte background you have to face those dimensions of religion um, uh, optional uh, well optional obviously you can face them or you or you can face and engage with them or you can ignore them depending uh, on your uh, desire to do so and on specific uh, story and hidden are somewhat forgotten. Uh, you have very little affordance provided by the game to engage with them. Uh, so, uh, the obviously important core dimension is ethical and legal. Uh, uh, gods in d, d are strongly characterized by their position on the alignment chart, while the class description of the cleric openly states that two most important questions players should ask themselves are what god do they serve and what principles they want to embody. In the same way, archetypes of clerics and paladins are differentiated through their ideals and values. Interesting consequences of this logic is necessity to include some sort of coherent, if somewhat unattractive, ethic for so-called evil gods, like lols and grooms, uh, and uh, the implication that problematic ethics of, for example, default draw society, as depicted in a character handbook, stems directly from lols teaching. 
basically adherence to laws as goddess is what makes draw evil. Second core dimension, uh, which serves as justification for ethical, is doctrinal dimension. Religions in D&D are based on the meta-religious doctrine of posthumous fate, which unites all different religions. Uh, when you die, you go to corresponding heaven or hell. On the other hand, the descriptions of some specific pantheons or spiritual traditions include hints and their particular doctrines, providing a metaphysical and philosophical justification for the ethical dimension, yet again. For example, indicating the superiority of a particular race or ecosystem. Optional categories include, first of all, social dimension. Uh, Acolyte special ability and description of, I, I, meant, I meant feature, and description of different uh, classes uh, implies uh, different facets of social dimensions, like social structures built around temples, solidarity of believers as a community, social roles performed by priests, and so on. At the same time, all those elements exist as a periphery of game rules. They are not directly included in the economies of experience, gold, rest, and spells around which the typical uh, gameplay in D&D revolves. Uh, so uh, players can easily ignore them without, uh, for example, making their character weaker uh, or ignoring a big part uh, of their own abilities. The mythological dimension is in the similar situation. Character handbook mentions deeds of different gods and also provides a description of so-called historical pensions, which most of us know through myth. Well, since thank you, high school. Uh, uh, their very presence may inspire players to address the subject and dungeon masters to create their own mythologies or use the existing ones for their campaigns. But the game does not present any universal way or need to include the mythological dimension. No systems or uh, narrative recommendations for retelling or remembering religious narratives. So while it is hard to entirely forget that religion does contain its own narratives, it is equally easy to ignore those narratives in any particular game session, even while playing as a religious character. Um, the, material, the material dimension of religion is somewhere in between the optional and the hidden, but closer to the latter. Rule-wise, religion in D&D is practically devoid of any material consideration. It lacks religious artifacts with obvious, spiritual, with obvious spiritual value. There are no elements resonating with veneration of icons and sacred animals, no specific religious architecture, and the religious economy is reduced to general ability of temples and communities to provide for their own, implied in the description of acolyte background. Character Handbook offers two game elements resonating with material dimension, holy symbols and material components for divine spells. However, the obvious parallel between those and focuses and material components of wizards and sorcerers provide enough affordances to overlook them. Uh, tellingly, holy symbol in character handbook, in handbook is framed as a separate and discrete artifact with fixed value. It's not any material object matching the description of God's symbol. It's a specifically made specific object with a fixed price. Uh, basically, it is a tool, not a symbol per se. Uh, druid cannot take any stick in the wood to use as a druid focus. Ritual dimensions, paradoxically, belongs to a hidden category as well. On the one hand, most religious classes use magic, which can be framed as resonating with religious ritual, up to literal use of the terms ritual uh, in the description. But the ritual dimension uh, from historical religion, uh, religions as a separate set of elements is a part of religions constructed by the actions imbued with specifically religious meaning. You do something because your religion requires you to do precisely that. And in that sense, it is absent. Rituals, both divine spells and ceremonies performed by acolyte, are framed as something extraordinary and not necessary for religious characters themselves in the day-to-day -day religious life. Unlike, for example, the need to follow a religious ethic. Divine magic is performed in combat or in other tense situation, while the acolyte ritual reinforces different social changes. They are external, they are not needed for acolyte uh, him or herself. 
The closest mechanic that resonates with the image of ritual performed by believers as part of believers' spiritual life is the monk's meditation, but the necessity of it is still grounded in the economy of combats and rests. Therefore, it is not required outside of a problematic environment of adventure. Same logic applies to emotional dimensions. A dimension. Individual spells and abilities, uh, especially from Paladin class, resonate with pop cultural images, which are again in turn inspired by stories from religious texts, uh, which kind of touch on the, emotional on the emotional dimension of religion. But the, the mechanics completely overshadow the, emotion the emotional dimension of religion by the ethical. Negative effects like fear or rage can be condemned by good gods and vice versa, but the system does not contain any affordances to simulate and play a desire for any emotional spiritual experience like religious ecstasy or feeling of divine presence. It can be, of course, role played by participants of the game if they are willing, but unlike in case of mythological and social dimensions, neither rules nor narrative descriptions offer a lot of hints at the importance of this element of religion in general. Anyway, this prioritization shows a consistently Christian-centered and secular approach to the depiction of religious characters within the Indy rules. Religion is presented and something, first of all, naturally private. It is entirely possible to adhere to a religion without religious community, material artifacts and texts, rituals or examples by same, some important historical or mythological figures. The only important thing for a believer is a success at doing or preventing some sort of practical change in the world, according to believers uh, God's teaching. This, in turn, implies that any religion is at heart a philosophical system that boils down to describing the world, doctrinal dimension, and implying the best course of action in it, ethical dimension. But unlike true philosophical system, the initial ideas for it are created by powerful deities who are ready to punish followers for their disobedience, both in this life and in the next. This reinforces already popular essentialist approach to the depiction of religion and religious believers as people whose main difference from non-believers are their relegation of ethical decision to the outside source. And uh, the source, I'm 30 seconds, uh, source whose philosophy is immutable, close to interpretation and can be easily grasped and presented in a very simple way. This approach is problematic, although admittedly somewhat natural uh, for a Western uh, religious thought. It strips the sphere of religion, among other things, from many elements that can be potentially incorporated in the mechanics and narratives of RPG, further, further enriching experience of the players and making representation of different cultures and communities in the game world more engaging, fun, and not least of all, respectful. Uh, thank you very much. Sorry, I was sure I would be on time, but I, I seem I'm a bit nervous, so I'm speaking slowly. It was a wonderful uh, presentation, Nunin, so thank you very much for it. Um, and we we have just one presentation left in all the conference, which is really exciting to say. Um, and uh, again, please stick around after that, because we're going to have a, a reception um, live after that. But introducing now, um, Megan Condes, uh, Condes with her paper, We Don't Cut Corners, Wendy's uh, Feast of Champions and the Subversion of Gamified Advertising. Um, Megan is an assistant professor in communication studies at Texas, Texas Tech University. Um, she has a book, Gaming Masculinity, Trolls, Fake Geeks, and the Gendered Battle for Online Culture out on the University of Iowa Press. And uh, Megan's research is awesome. It's so interesting to look at how these sort of like apparatuses of advertising um, intersect with uh, these apparatuses of popular or these products of popular culture like Dungeons and Dragons. So Megan, just, just lay it on us. All right, can everybody hear me? I think I'm unmuted. Awesome. Uh, so to start with, uh, apologies in advance because this presentation might make you hungry. I do have some pictures of food in here. Um, the process of doing this research kept always made me hungry. I definitely visited Wendy's several times during the course of 
of writing this. So I guess it worked on me. Um, I want to begin just by talking about the sort of context of gamified advertisements. So gamified advertisements are really old um, and they can refer to anything from, you know, loyalty programs like accumulate so many stamps to get a free sub or, um, you know, complex systems of points and rewards like airline miles or credit card deals or things like that. Um, but they can also be uh, games as products. So things like uh, video games that feature mascots for various corporations like the Noid of Domino's Pizza or the Kool-Aid Man. Um, more recent examples might be the Burger King Xbox Live suite of games that featured that, that creepy king with his like big mask and beard. Um, or KFC has gotten into this a lot recently with a VR escape room called The Hard Way and also a kind of dating sim visual novel called I Love You Colonel Sanders. <laughs> um, so check those out if you are bored sometime over the summer and you don't mind a little bit of uh, silly advertising coming your way. Um, but in addition to these, uh, marketers and brand experts have been branching out into board game and role-playing game venues as a way to explore gamified advertising. Um, for example, um, Aaron has written about Old Spice creating a gentleman class for Dungeons and Dragons. Um, in our awesome Discord that we have set up for this conference, um, and I can't remember who, so I'm not gonna be able to give credit, but someone mentioned that nerds, like the candy nerds, is coming out with some D&D &D content later this year, so we'll have to like look forward to that. Um, but the one that I wanted to focus on for this presentation was Wendy's who created Feast of Legends, which was a 90 page PDF that is still available for download um, on the Feast of Legends website. And it is a fully playable tabletop role playing game in the sense that uh, it runs you through character creation. These are two of the character classes that you can choose. And it runs you through uh, an adventure that's divided up into six different modules. So it's kind of a self-contained uh, adventure with a rule book and character classes and enemies and maps and everything. Um, so a little bit of overview on the game itself. It takes place in the world of Beef's Keep where Queen Wendy is the ruler of this region and she is up against a couple of rival nations. One of them is Creeping Vale and one of them is the United Clown Nations. And it's heavily implied in the rule book, but not outright stated that these are representative of other fast food chains. So Creeping Vale has a creepy king, that would be like the Burger King. And then the United Clown Nations is ruled by the Ice Gesture, who is uh, Ronald McDonald. And the problem with these rival nations is that they are conspiring to plunge Beef's Keep into an ice age, a magical ice age called the Deep Freeze. And the, the point of this whole campaign is designed to really drive home the idea that uh, Wendy's beef is supposed to be fresh, but never frozen. And so all of the, the sort of story of the game that is being presented is about preventing Wendy's from succumbing to the deep freeze. And the various boss characters that you encounter or the enemy characters that you encounter over the course of a campaign all resemble uh, the characters from the kind of mythologies of these other fast food franchises. So uh, you have the beef bandit, who is like the hamburglar. You have um, the fry fiends, who are like the fry kids from the old McDonald's commercials. You have Constable Von Fries, who is supposed to be like Officer Big Mac, et cetera. So it's very, it's like highly referential um, in, a, in a weird way. And, and also maybe like referencing things that I think maybe younger people wouldn't necessarily have a reference to, but people you know, in their thirties and up would be like, I remember those commercials from, from being a kid. Um, and as I stated earlier, the game is designed to put you into uh, the role of one of these classes that are designed based on Wendy's food. So you could choose to be uh, in the order of the double stack or the order of the baked potato. And that would be like being a cleric or like being a barbarian or what have you. And each role has these pun related skills that have to do with what kind of food that you represent. Um, so for example, if you are in the order of the baked potato, you have a, a skill called the root of the problem because you're a potato. Hilarious, right? All very punny, very silly, um, very fun. Uh, so as I stated earlier, 
the game is based on a kind of a Dungeons and Dragons-esque set. It, it requires kind of like Pri was talking about earlier, a lot of dice rolling. You construct your character and you have to these base stats that determine, I'm sure I'm explaining this. You guys all know how Dungeons and Dragons works, right? Like if I want to lift something heavy, I have to roll a strength check. Or if I want to do uh, like make a really charming speech, I have to roll charm or intelligence or whatever. You guys get it. Um, <laughs> So one thing that's unique about this system though, is that you can receive in-game bonuses and buffs based on out-of-game behaviors related to food. So there are rule sets within the game describing um, what kind of snacks that you have during your gaming session. And if you have snacks that come from Wendy's or that match your character class that you've selected, then you get bonuses for your character. Or if you eat something else, so if you choose to order pizza or if you go with chicken wings or if you go with something other than Wendy's, then your character experiences debuffs. So they have like penalties to their rules. And so at first glance, when reading through the rule set, as a person who's looking at like marketing communication, you go, okay, got it. So this is a demonstrative advertisement, which means uh, it's trying to demonstrate the effectiveness or the desirability of the product of the Wendy's food by demonstrating that it has these effects within the game that are positive. So like eating hamburgers from Wendy's makes you stronger, right? So, oh, that means the advertisement's supposed to convince me that like eating this food will make me stronger. Um, also, narratively, the game connects Wendy's as a brand and Queen Wendy as a character with this idea of freshness by having her reject the deep freeze and having her kind of like coat of arms or, or her like royal decree be the Wendy slogan, which is we do not cut corners, um, as if to suggest like, you know, Wendy's puts extra care and extra attention to their food. They're not just like slapping together some crappy burgers out of frozen meat. Also, I will say... Uh, over the course of doing this work, I've realized that we do not cut corners is also a pun about how Wendy's hamburgers are square instead of round, like they didn't cut the corners off. And I was like, am I the last person in America who understood that, that this was about square hamburgers? But I was, that like blew my mind when I finally figured that out. So, you know, in keeping with the puns, a lot of uh, the materials have to do with, you know, we we do not cut corners. We always want to stay fresh and we're fighting against the scourge of, of frozenness. But um, if you take a closer look at the manual, you might notice that there is a lot of text in this game that suggests that this really simple like one-to-one -one correlation of demonstrate burger in game is good equals buy burger in real life, that that's not really something that the game is relying on. Um, the creators of the game really lampshade the obviousness of this connection and kind of constantly draw attention to the fact that it is an advertisement, kind of winking at the person who's playing and saying, we know that you know that we're just creating a commercial. And so we're not going to like pretend that you're so not savvy, that you're not understanding that we're just advertising to you. And that was really interesting to me, this idea of we went to the trouble to create this really elaborate it's a 90 page fully illustrated manual for this thing. So obviously a ton of work got put into this. And then we're like undercutting that work by being like, isn't it goofy that we're all advertising to you via this, this crazy mechanism. And so that got me really interested in this sort of gamified advertisement that if it's not trying to earnestly engage you in demonstrated advertising, then what could it be doing in order to create an appeal. And, and the, what I landed on was, I think it's actually underneath the kind of demonstrative advertising, it's actually an associative advertisement in that it's trying to link Wendy's as a brand to a lifestyle or a subculture, the, the gaming lifestyle and subculture. So rather than being about convincing you that Wendy's burgers are gonna power you up or are actually these like, super special, wonderful products. Instead, they wink at the player and they say, uh, we want to put ourselves forth as the fast food brand of choice for gamers. And in doing that, we're going to try to kind of communicate on your level. We're going to try to use the vocabulary that you like to use. And we're going to treat you as though you're too smart to fall for the typical type of advertisements. We're going to kind of like flatter you into saying, oh, gamers, see behind the scenes and they're going to understand 
the, the sort of tricks that we're playing as advertisers. And by us acknowledging that, we want to kind of show that we are the brand that is savvy about gaming as a pastime. Um, as part of this appeal, they also engage in what uh, several of our other panelists have talked about in uh, kind of participatory branding exercises. So encouraging gamers to show off their gamer cred by engaging with the game and with Wendy's branding. And so if you look up hashtag Feast of Legends on Twitter, you'll find lots of examples of people, people taking pictures of their games that they have set up, showing off their sketches of their characters, doing Wendy's cosplay, all these types of things. So Wendy's is saying you can show off to other gamers that you're savvy about tabletop gaming or about online gaming by engaging with our brand. And that becomes this like win-win of you can show off that you're an elite pro gamer. We get to get the kind of associative shine off of you that says that gamer Wendy's is cool and, and hip and savvy to gaming culture. Um, but one really interesting uh, risk that brands can take on when they engage in this type of participatory branding exercise is that they leave themselves open to people who participate in ways that they don't expect or that maybe they don't want. Um, so in the case of the Wendy's uh, role-playing game, this took the form of kind of, I guess you could call it like protest gaming or um, kind of a hacking of the game that was designed to highlight some of Wendy's's negative business practices. Um, so the ones that I were able to find revolved around this thing called the Fair Food Project, which is a project designed to get uh, big retailers and fast food programs to acknowledge uh, farm workers and to pay farm workers fair wages. And Wendy's is sort of notorious as being a, whole, a holdout in this program that they refused to sign up for this program. They didn't want to participate in it. So they didn't want to essentially uh, work towards fair labor practices with uh, agricultural workers. And that has caused a lot of controversy for them. So a couple of years ago, there was a big thing about various college campuses having students saying they want to get Wendy's off their campus because they refuse to participate in the spare food program. And it's just like a big thing. So when Wendy's announced that they were going to be creating this game, uh, they attracted the attention of some of these protesters. And so you would have people creating modified versions of the game or modified play sessions of the game where instead of, for example, Queen Wendy wanting to protect Beef's Keep because she's just so virtuous and wonderful, she turns into this dictator who's interested in just maintaining her control over her subjects. And, and, and so she's like punishing the, the farmers of her land. Or you even have um, one creator uh, made a counter game called Silence Brand, which was uh, a kind of cyberpunk RPG about resisting attempts by corporations to uh, hijack social media and to advertise to people. So it became like a game commenting on the existence of advert games. Um, and the initial scenario, the initial campaign of this game, Silence Brand, that you can find uh, for free on Google Docs, um, is aimed at Wendy's, but then it also has modules that you can use to create uh, I guess you could call it like protest games against Amazon and Nestle and Monsanto. And it details all of these different corporations and the types of you know, practices that they've engaged in in the past. And it also, I thought this was pretty, I don't know, interesting or funny. Um, so when the Silence Brand game got published, it contained at the very top of the game, a link to the Boycott Wendy's website. And in the very bottom of the, the game document, it had a list of useful resources. And one of them was just a link to the digital archives of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. So it's like very explicitly political. It's like not even trying to pretend that it's anything other than we're using this game as a vehicle to share our own kind of ideology and our own kind of political activist purposes. Um, and so in conclusion, what I think is really interesting about this game as a case study is that it shows kind of the power that games can have as vehicles for getting people to engage and vehicles for getting people to explore, um, you know, like branded worlds. Oops, that was my, so let me just finish this sentence real quick. Um, so it's, it shows the power of these games in the sense that we can look online and see the gaming community kind of engaging with it and participating in this uh, kind of branding exercise. 
but it also demonstrates how uh, kind of gamer culture, maybe this is referencing something that Pre talked about. Yeah, you know, I feel like gamer culture isn't super keen on being told how they must play. And so, you know, the idea of presenting this game and kind of winking at the player and saying, we are inviting you to help us spread our brand around, but there's, you know, some people in gamer culture who are like, no, thank you. I would rather use this as an opportunity to get my own messages out about how I feel about this brand and to create associations with that brand that maybe the marketers didn't intend when they created this, this game. Um, so, you know, if any of you guys are looking for a one shot and you want to play the Wendy's RPG, <laughs> hit me up on the Discord and, and I can run you through a session. Or perhaps maybe we'll just save it and we'll wait for the Nerds RPG to come out later this year and we can all play together. Um, but thank you guys very much. And I look forward to, to chatting with you guys here in the end of our panel. This was a great panel. Um, so thank you, everybody. Um, I want to start actually with some of the questions that got answered on the Q&A. Uh, and then I'll start working through the ones that are unanswered. So um, if you if you put your answer into text, uh, forgive me as I just ask you to kind of work through it again, because I think it's important um, that we go through all of these for, for the entire crew. As uh, you all know, there's a lot of different channels of discourse happening simultaneously, which is actually kind of joyous. It feels like a real life conference where there's side conversations and conversations in the hall. Um, but I do think that the Q&A channel is one that I want to dignify as much as possible here. So we'll start with Jack Murray's question to Pri. Um, in the analog digital hybridity panel yesterday, we had a discussion about pushing back on the perceived analog digital dichotomy. In your presentation, you identified a digital non-digital split. So I was wondering if you have any thoughts on the relationship between digital, non-digital, and the analog in what we're referring, we've been referring to as analog game studies. Yeah, so uh, I wasn't able to make the panel because it was just a little bit too early um, in Australia time. Um, but my initial thoughts uh, kind of split up into two different categories. So like how we use those terms in like academia and how players are describing their play. So there was definitely a dichotomy in player experiences. So the, the players I talk to, and this may be different to D&D players, you know, all around the world, um, but in my observations, there was always like a, they, they always pitted digital games and non-digital games against each other. So they would justify their D&D play by, you know, bringing video game experiences down like okay I'm playing d and it's it's really cool because we're doing all of this in person not like those video games like World of Warcraft where you can't do this and you can't do that so it was it was definitely like that dichotomy was present um I think the terms though can be useful in academia because we have to be able to situate and contextualize our work clearly. And I think that those terms do help us in doing that. Uh, but at the same time, I'm sure as is the case with, you know, all of us, it's really frustrating to be able to have to justify our work again, again, and again. So it's like, oh, like I'm doing game studies work. Oh, but it's on non-digital games. It's on analog games, right? We're just talking about games and, yeah, so I, I have a little, yeah, conflicting and controversial thoughts, but if anyone else has any thoughts, I'd love to hear them. Well, I'll let that simmer unless anybody has something that's burning. We have a few more questions. Um, I thought that was a great answer nonetheless. Um, Tim Krause asks, uh, I'm curious what the panelists, all panelists, think of the roller blade Kleenex effect that Dungeons and Dragons has had on tabletop RPGs, either good or bad. By that, I mean, in the world at large, playing D&D has become somewhat synonymous with playing tabletop RPGs, good or bad. I know, Bill, you have a prepared answer for this, but I'm also curious what the rest of the panel thinks. Yeah, so I mean, uh, I'll just uh, quickly make the point that I, I, I wanted to make, which is that, um, you know, regarding D&D as intellectual property is, is a move in and of itself. That's kind of interesting, right? It, it sort of, um, it takes role playing as a medium and turns it into somebody's property. And, and um, uh, 
uh, the the um, uh, some of the critique of that is that well, um, if you just package uh, these procedures uh, and throw them out at and say that's uh, a publication that I own, um, that kind of interferes with normal processes of cultural dissemination, folk culture kind of thing. So it's, I mean, it's just an interesting sort of framing of, well, this is what's happening. It's intellectual property rather than it's culture more broadly. I guess I will maybe add on to that. I think there is some utility in Dungeons and Dragons being like a shorthand that when you explain to someone what you're doing, like, you know, I'm going to get together with a group of friends, we're going to play Call of Cthulhu. What's that? And you can just say, well, it's like Dungeons and Dragons. And they're like, oh, and they immediately understand. Like, so that that is useful, I think. But yeah, it is it is interesting to think about how that does reduce in people's minds, like what the, the sort of like vast spectrum of activity you could be doing. Like, you know, it's no longer uh, interactive theater or it's no longer, um, what's the word? Like like improv, it's now just like, oh yeah, it's like rolling dice and having a character sheet and, and uh, of course. And so, yeah, there, I think there are some, some pros in, in the same way that like, you know, Marvel getting big and making like superheroes more accessible and like a thing you could talk to your, your you know, parents or your friends at work about, like, that's nice, but it also maybe like flattens it out into, you know, something that, well, everyone understands what we're talking about now, but it means there's only one version of that, that, that people really have access to. Uh, I can just very briefly add that, uh, well, <laughs> uh, here in Russia, uh, I see the theoretical problem which uh, Megan presented, but since, uh, for example, we do not have improv here in any way, uh, it is completely alien idea. Uh, uh, so the damage is theoretically massive, but in practice uh, minimal since, uh, uh, well, Z and Z is, uh, introducing people to the very idea of role play as an activity. Uh, so we do not have any other reference to it in, like at all. Yeah, I tend to agree with the other panelists sentiments. I think it's a, it's a good starting point. I don't think that associating D and D with tabletop games is purely reductive, because you know people don't just stop at D and D. Usually, they will go on to find out more about different games catered to you know the genres that they like or the play styles that they like. So yeah, uh, both positive and negative. Great, great answers there. Um, here's a question for Leonid. Um, Cody Walliser, Walliser is interested in the figure of the monk as an explicitly aged coded religious figure, chi points, ninja kensei, drunken master, etc. Are you aware of any work on Eastern religion and gaming? How do you see the monk in D&D? &D? Uh, well, uh, it's uh, come out time. I'm not a big uh, specialist actually on analog game. I come from digital game studies background, so I can just, you know, address to uh, work on Orientalism in uh, digital games, like, I don't know, digital Arabs from which is okay, it's uh, about Middle East, but the very point of Orientalism is to conflate uh, uh, anything East uh, to, I don't know, Germany into one big uh, uh, orientalistic blob. And um, if uh, you're interested, I can ask around and send, you, if you give me your e email, I can ask around and send some particular work. It, it would be great. Uh, I, I would be very glad to do this. Uh, the only thing that just come to mind is that um, uh, Monk reiterates a lot of myths about Eastern religions uh, in itself. Not, I mean, not myths from Eastern religions, but myths about it. Uh, and, uh, well, 
I get, but I don't know. I guess, I guess this is somewhat obvious if I remember correctly. He was strongly inspired by uh, popularity of Bruce Lee movies, uh, like Enter the Dragon. So the history of its appearance is pretty straightforward. I think that was a really good answer. Um, and, and there's also a bunch of links being put into both the Discord and the chat, I think, um, for a follow up oh, on that cool, question. Cool, cool. Um, but it's a, an excellent question, and more work should certainly be done on that because it is really interesting. Um, uh, Jared Armistead um, asks, are there any representations, uh, we'll come back to Tim's question because we already began it. Um, are there any re representations of non-Western religious systems or tropes within Dungeons and Dragons? And um, do they fit into the same core optional hidden categories? Um, so that's a question I assume also for Leonid, but I think anyone can field it if you have some insight there. Well, uh, as I was trying to show, this logic is uh, baseline for character handbook. I mean, uh, if, uh, for example, in the uh, D&D second edition, uh, among historical pantheons, there was Hindu pantheon. Uh, and uh, it uh, was represented with the same logic and uh, judging i don't know by for example game of Sions, uh, it's from absolutely another publisher but i'm absolutely sure that i don't know if someone were to create a representation of chinese religion in dnz they would follow the same logic because well that's what the logic is for uh, uh, they've already built the way to digest any religion, uh, and uh, you can just pour, pour anything there. I don't know, Native American beliefs, Scientology, uh, a, uh, Far Asian beliefs, uh, imagined religion, uh, they would be just dissected in the same way. Okay, you have a religion, so you have clerics, so you have some ethics clerics should follow so we have to create ethics and we haven't imagined any religious rituals for any religion before so why we should start now uh, and so on and so forth. again then dnd is extremely big so i'm i do not suspect i'm reasonably sure that there are for example some uh, campaigns where they have some rituals uh, described uh, but uh, this uh, this is a very big uh, theme. Let's just say, uh, usually rituals are used to exoticize a religion. If you see ritual in game, it is usually something weird, very complex, not easy to actually do because you have to chant for hours and designate it to mark someone as other. Uh, we never participate in rituals. We have one more question from Tim Krause, and then I have a question for the panel after that. Um, so from Tim, does the presence of adver games signify a sort of cultural coming of age for the tabletop RPG community in that it is the product of them being the true market uh, for large advertising budgets? Are there good byproducts of this? I love that question because I love the phrase coming of age uh, in that it suggests that like, tabletop RPGs were child's play before and that now that they can become like a profit center that that means that they're all grown up and I think I think I, there are probably a lot of people who would think of it that way and I think what the resistance to Wendy's game demonstrates is that people in the tabletop community are kind of eager to push back against that and to demonstrate that like these games are play, but they've also always been serious and they've always been grown up. Uh, and so just, you know, transforming it into a, into a market doesn't make it more legitimate or less legitimate. But, but in, in I, that's, I guess, me trying to like really probably overthink the phrasing of the question, but like in, in, the, in the sense of like, does it represent um, like tabletop RPGs maybe kind of coming you know, into like into popular enough understanding that they're like legible as a market or, or as an audience, like, perhaps like, 
it, it definitely means that someone thought it was worth paying writers and illustrators to, to create this thing. Um, in the same way that like the, the, the examples of like Burger King creating an Xbox game suggests that they've calculated that there's enough people with an Xbox console out there that this is you know, a worthy avenue. But I also think it's interesting that like the whole point of these games is to have the company position itself as like, not like those other lame old companies We're like the new young fresh company. So in a way it's like not so much RPGs coming of age, but like a way that these companies can kind of try to seem youthful. Like that they're trying to uh, garner this image of being capable of spontaneity and play and not just like gray, venerable institutions of capitalism. I don't know if that answered your question, but that was kind of like the riffs that were popping into my head when I saw it show up in the Q&A. Yeah, I, I, I mean, just this realistic question I have a little, but like for me, there, there's something, there's like a passing of the torch between generations and cool um, that we're in the middle of. And it's like something that used to be cool, like around music or something. The same cachet is like coming down around RPGs these days, which is kind of amazing to witness, but also really difficult to understand. Um, so my question is the entire panel was predicated on this idea of looking backwards, right? What the legacy of Dungeons and Dragons, like looking at this sort of history, this deep dive into what it's done. Um, and I guess in the, the last five minutes we have left, I'd implore all of you to kind of give us some thoughts on what you'd like the future of Dungeons and Dragons and I guess role-playing games more broadly to be, because I think that'd be a really nice way, a utopic note uh, to end on is like, kind of trying to imagine futures and think through what this sort of like speculative future of role-playing might be. So any thoughts on, on that note? Um, should it be more like a prognosis or wishful thinking? Can, care to elaborate a little? Uh, I mean, uh, what I want the future to be, what I think it would be. <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, well, I would be very glad for more nuanced representation of religion. I think that was pretty clear by uh, my uh, talk because D&D is such an influential media as was <laughs> present here as that. Um, so the, for example, this architecture of religion, religious dimensions is present in most of commercial uh, tabletop RPGs from World of Darkness to, I don't know, Seven Seas uh, and uh, Legacy, for example. Uh, in fact, the game where there is no, there isn't any narrative presented, but still the rules force uh, to adapt uh, this architecture of uh, religious representation, which is very problematic. I didn't have a time to describe why, just, well, <laughs> you have to trust me. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm really interested in how these types of games, um, I don't want to say this, I get maybe linking back to like the, the first day when we had discussions about like pedagogy and games in the classroom and things like that. Like I'm interested in how the, the systematic nature of these games can be used to explore um, like real world institutions or like, you know, and we're starting to see games, or I guess not even really starting to see, but like they're starting to get more attention in mainstream media. Like this is a game that is exploring what it means to codify race as a system of rules to, to, to speak about our keynote from today, or this is a game that's designed to speak about the relationships between like human beings and the environment so we can explore blah, blah, blah. And I guess what I'm just really interested in is less like those systems themselves, but also, but more like, I think players are such great critics of games and systems and like their capability to look at games that are created and say like, well, is this an accurate representation or how might we change the rule set in order to create different scenarios and things like that? Like that's something that I think I'm really interested in and something that I think it's really cool that we're starting to have these college programs that are taking games as media that are worth critiquing and that are worth you know, creating critical systems to engage with games. Like it, 
I'm really just glad that that exists. I, I think that's going to be really important in the future as both digital and analog games start to take on or continue to take on these really important subjects. Yeah, um, for me, I guess, like, building on the digital stuff that I kind of explored today, I think we're, we're already seeing how the core elements of D&D &D are transferring across to these different types of mediums, right? Like, the, the storytelling of D&D, &D, it still remains the same, even if you're playing it in person or online. And so I'm, I'm not sure what the future holds whether it is just going to be more of the same like it it has changed obviously over the last 50 years but at the same time it hasn't um so i yeah i'd be really interested to see maybe the mediums or the environments in which D, &D is played in the future because i think i think the gameplay will likely be similar obviously with you know, tweaks and changes to content and themes and, you know, as they arise. Um, but yeah, those those are my initial thoughts. Uh, it looks like we're out of time, but um, just real quick, I just, um, uh, I like the notion of games as medium, right? Think of role-playing game as a medium in and of itself. And so the idea that um, taking that seriously, the changing uh, affordances that we use to play it, right? The technologies that we use to mediate it, um, that's going to have an impact on on what it is, right? I mean, the core remains the same, but 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 changes. And one of the ways, one of the uh, changes that um, uh, can occur is how it dysfunctions, how it breaks down, and how it um, uh, you know how it becomes problematic. And so, uh, uh, one of the things that's interesting about the increased mediation of games is. Um, their increased like consumption of them. And, and so what I'd like is, uh, what I'd like to see is some resistance to that, resistance to games as consumption and more about games as production, games as participation, like, uh, like thinking about that, emphasizing that, uh, being uh, self-reflexive and, and self-conscious about that uh, as to focus on what's really cool and essential about role-playing games. I think that's a great note to end it on, Bill and Megan and Pri and Leonid. This was a wonderful panel. Uh, this was a wonderful conference. I'm going to put you all back into attendee roles now. Then uh, Evan, Shelley, and I are going to um, say some final words. And then I think hopefully what will happen is we're either going to open up another room to confer in, or we're just going to make everybody uh, panelists, and we'll all just be able to confer uh, Brady Bunch style in Zoom. So we'll see how that works. But uh, back to order for a brief moment um, and uh, for the reception. So here we go. trying to, to figure this zooming out. I feel like Zoom is tired at this point. All right, Evan and Shelley, maybe, maybe just turn off the screens for the time being and then uh, Evan and Shelley will turn on the screens and then we'll reset a little. Um, Evan and Shelley may also be away at the moment um, as uh, they figure out things. I think they're probably coming. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, we we really wanted to kind of uh, steer you all towards um, while we're awaiting other folks, uh, Evan and Shelley, to show up is the um, incoming the the kind of it's one of the channels in the discord upcoming projects we just kind of want to make sure that everybody knows that's there um one of our big goals with generation analog was to turn this into a community that is within discourse a little more um uh with each other oh wait a second it seems like things are happening okay so zoom is totally doing things much better. There we are. Okay. I am so relieved. I was worried that I was going to have to talk for 10 minutes all on my own. Um, anyways, uh, I'll finish saying my thing and then I'll flip it to one of you. But we, we were really excited um, to make this a true community where there's discourse and projects and collaborations happening. And so we're really happy that the upcoming projects, aka the shameless plugs area, 
of the Discord is so happening. There's really like so much cool stuff in there. Um, different cool projects, books, um, labs, other discords that you can go visit. I really think that everything in that area is just an awesome resource of where the community is right now. And so I just encourage everybody before leaving the conference, take a second, pop through the sort of upcoming projects area, see what really gets you interested and engage with the community, because this is hopefully going to be an annual thing. And hopefully there's going to be more things like this happening in the, the years ahead. So I think that's one of the most exciting things that we have uh, right now. So check that out, um, please. Um, all right, other stuff. Other stuff. Um, again, recordings, uh, you're going to get a message from, from Aaron Trammell, who will ask you for permission to share your video. And first, you're gonna, we're gonna ask you uh, if you want to share the video at all, if you want to share the video just in a circle of the participants, or 